It all started with setting an intention, sort of like a New Year's resolution, but it was October, October of the longest year many of us have ever lived, 2020. I'd spent the year adjusting to a new normal, teaching college students from my laptop, helping others embrace self-care in the midst of a pandemic, and indulging a newfound passion for baking that was beginning to spiral out of control. I needed to stabilize myself. I was compelled to find an outlet in the wake of the pandemic and the relentless fight against systemic racism and societal injustices, the combination of which scientists were referring to as a syndemic. I needed reassurance that there was a light at the end of the tunnel and that it wasn't the flicker of an oncoming train. So I set two intentions, healing and growth. An unlikely idea started to form in my mind. I should take up gardening. This struck me by surprise, given an extensive history of plants that have lost the will to live under my care, or rather, my negligence. And although my research focuses on self-care and I teach stress management, I'd never even considered gardening as a healing practice. So. Why am I here talking to you about gardening today? I'm here to tell you about what gardening did for me. It gave me a way to reconnect with something positive in a world that felt increasingly toxic and volatile. This experience of learning to nurture and care for a garden was healing, giving me a sense of agency in a time of uncertainty. Learning to grow the food that I consumed taught me important lessons about resilience the ability to bounce back and move forward in the face of adversity. I'd like to share these lessons with you. The first lesson is to reconnect with your foundation. I'd like to tell you about how connecting with the land helped me to reconnect to the strength of my family roots. I had been casually following a local Black-owned urban farm on social media for several months when a specific social media post caught me by surprise and shifted me from admiring gardens from afar to being compelled to start one of my own. In the photo, I saw a picture of a black hand grasping a yam from the soil. I recognized the yam as a beloved dish at family gatherings and as a daily staple in my own home. I recognized the hand, black, like my own. However, it was the lamb that I was disconnected from. The labor of this hand fully emerged in the soil, the process of nurturing and growing this yam were completely foreign to me. The post went on to explain the aversion that many blacks have to working with the land, given what they called a painful association with slavery and sharecropping. They spoke of gardening as a lost art. It made me think about my family's roots in Tangipahoe Parish, Louisiana. My great-great-great-great-grandfather, Robert Vernon, known as Free Bob or Deacon Bob, grew up enslaved in Mississippi and was separated from his wife and sons when they were sold to different plantations. He eventually was able to purchase his freedom and move to Louisiana to join his father, growing cotton on 160 acres of land that he would eventually go on to expand to more than 2,000 acres, reunite with his sons, and create a family legacy. And although we've lost much of this acreage over the years, we still have relatives living on the land that bears our family name, Vernon Town. Here, Robert Vernon Road is named for my great-great-great-great-grandfather, my grandmother was raised on this land. Her family grew string beans, corn, and potatoes to sell, and sugarcane to take to the mill for processing. My family eventually moved to California in search of opportunity. However, I have memories of my grandfather dropping off bags of peas for us to snap every summer. A child of the 80s, I didn't understand why he would go to the trouble to drive out to the fields or why my grandmother would have us sit and snap peas for days when they were available in the freezer section of the grocery market. However, I'm grateful now to have had even a slight connection to my family's heritage. This story of my people's land and our strength flows through my veins. Gardening reminds me of our ability to create with our own bare hands. As I garden, I am taking part in a ritual that has nourished my family for more than a century. 
Knowing that I'm a part of this legacy reminds me of the strength that I possess to face challenges with courage and confidence. The second lesson is to embrace a beginner's mind. While I've always enjoyed nature hikes and felt a natural connection to the ocean, I'd never thought about a practice in which I was able to partner with nature in its creative process. My garden began with seedlings of plants, such as cabbage, onions, lettuce, broccolini, edible flowers, and spinach. Judging by my initial reactions to my new responsibilities of watering regularly and checking for pests, you would have thought these were newborn babies. My mind was flooded with questions and doubts. What if I overwater my plants? What if I underwater them? Of course, I did both in the beginning. Fortunately, I had the opportunity to work with master gardeners. They helped me to ease into the process, patiently listening to my struggles and my woes as they constructed my beds, maintained my soils, and taught me how to prune, deadhead, weed, water, harvest, and everything in between. They truly had my back. This partnership helped to alleviate my anxiety and embrace being a beginner, a big deal for someone who expects herself to be good at everything. The third lesson is that you must nurture what you want to see grow. My dill plant started out tiny and scrawny before growing more than four feet tall and towering over all the rest of my plants. I hesitated to pick it because if I removed even two leaves, it might be bare. I actually thought it was dead for a while, but I kept watering it two to three times a week just to be sure. And as time passed, it developed strong roots, thick stems, and the ability to grow in the directions that best ensured its survival. Given its productivity, dill is now constantly featured in our egg, fish, and salad dishes. I've taken this lesson from the garden into my daily life. I'm reminded to keep working towards my goals and to not be deterred if they don't come to fruition immediately. Fresh dill is incredibly bold and a little bit goes a long way. Its powerful flavor represents the confidence I want to have in myself. Rather than stress over every detail, I want to strive for consistency and focus on practices that help me stay the course when life becomes difficult. In a way, I'm watering myself when I slow down and engage in practices that help me to recover, like meditation, devotion, and expressing gratitude. The more that I incorporate these practices in my daily life, the better I am able to cope with the stress that life throws my way. The fourth lesson is to let go of control and perfection. When you think of weeds, do dandelions come to mind? How about chamomile? Your answer is likely shaped by your experiences with these plants. Weeds are defined as plants that grow where they are not desired. I grew up thinking only of dandelions as weeds, but it turns out they were historically valued for their beauty, nutritional value, and use as a medicine. Perspective is everything. It seems that they've been successfully rebranded in recent years as they are featured in salads, wines, and, and even coffee substitutes. While I didn't plan to grow dandelion, it did grow in my garden free of pesticides, which meant I could eat the leaves and salads. I can spend my time fighting against the strong, determined will of this plant, or I can learn how to value and utilize its strengths. Now, we did plant the chamomile on purpose, but it started to grow quickly and soon made it difficult for nearby plants to thrive. So we relocated some of it to another bed. However, it isn't a weed to me. It's a sanctuary. When the problems of this world start to overwhelm me, I step into my garden and I can feel my body release stress as I tend to harvesting chamomile in a meditative state, one flower at a time. My husband and I have come to look forward to an evening ritual of sipping chamomile, lemongrass, and mint teas fresh from the garden. I wasn't always good at noticing these simple pleasures. Initially, I spent an embarrassing amount of time chasing off soil gnats and searching online for the perfect tools or gloves or other ways to automate and simplify my garden tasks. That is to say, my issues followed me into my relationship with gardening. I wasn't sure I was ready for the commitment of having to water my plants every two or three days. What if I wanted to go somewhere? And if a plant withered, drooped, or died, I was convinced it was confirmation that gardening 
was not for me. I used to pull even the smallest hint of a weed every single weekend. Recently, I pulled out an entire Swiss chard plant because as much as I treated the powdery mildew on its leaves, it kept coming back. Upon further reflection, I was feeling a bit down that day. And the Swiss chard was an innocent bystander. With a bit of patience, I could have washed the mildew off and removed some of the more severely impacted leaves, giving it a chance to grow back. Pulling it out was admittedly a bit of an overreaction. However, that empty spot in the garden now reminds me in life to take a moment to breathe and to reflect before I respond to a situation. It is helpful for me to remember that the path to joy travels through mindfulness not perfection. I have to be present with my current reality and accept it without judgment. There are opportunities for joy in our daily lives, but we miss most of them because our minds are busy thinking about the past or what we have to do next or what could possibly go wrong. When is the last time that you pause to admire the colors of the sky or to notice the growth of leaves on a tree as it emerges from the winter and welcomes the spring? When I step into the garden, it is a fully immersive experience. I take in the colors, the fragrances, and the textures. Because I pay close attention to my garden on a near daily basis, I can quickly sense changes in growth and appearance. These small changes bring me joy. I know that not all of my vegetables are going to survive my beginner gardening skills, and the rest of them will eventually be harvested and eaten. For this reason, I try to appreciate the current state of my garden. If I required perfection, I never would have started it in the first place. My garden isn't in an ideal sunny area, and I deal with my fair share of pests. And yet, I keep showing up to tend to my garden, using it as an escape from my daily life, fighting against entropy because of the joy that I get out of this imperfect masterpiece that I've created. In a similar way, I want to be present enough to enjoy the blessings, relationships, and experiences that I currently have in my life. I don't want to make the mistake of waiting for perfect conditions. I've lived too much of my life this way. It's time to let go of this expectation. The normalcy that we've been mourning the loss of is likely not returning, at least not in the form that we remembered. We have to start valuing what remains. We can't do it all or fix it all, and that's okay. In fact, it came as a relief to me to finally accept that I don't have all of the answers. Embracing uncertainty is what allows me to focus on what is under my control. The fifth and final lesson is to find healing in community. The gardening community that I'm a part of has had a profound impact on me. The beautiful harvest that I grow in my garden is a reflection of every person that helped me to construct it, find my feet as a beginner, and embrace a deeper appreciation for the healing power of fresh food. Recently, one of the expert gardeners that I had the fortune of working with passed away unexpectedly. He taught me the true meaning of soul food as he tended to each of my plants with great care. Soul food is the loving labor poured into creating meals that nurture our soul as well as our bodies. And that starts with the growing process. Interacting with passionate gardeners has also influenced my own diet. They've exposed me to a lifestyle of stepping out into the garden after a long day to clip some lettuce and some herbs for my meals, which I frequently do now. The more connected I am to the growing process, the more I find myself drawn to eating whole unprocessed foods and actually prioritizing them over the refined carbohydrates and added sugars that I previously craved. Gardening is a springboard for connection. I've joined several online forums for black women who garden, something I never imagined existed. We give ourselves the gift of representation, sharing images we rarely see of ourselves in the media, tending to acres of land, and elderly women posting selfies where they look 20 years younger than their actual age. We help each other troubleshoot and care for our plants. We engage in communal healing as we learn to nurture life together, and it heals us as we deal with traumas in the outside world. I share lessons from my garden with my friends on social media, and even my local farm shares these lessons with our greater community. I've highlighted for you how gardening has been a tool for joy, resilience, and healing in my life 
through teaching me five important lessons. One, reconnect with your foundation. Two, embrace a beginner's mind. Three, nurture what you want to see grow. Four, let go of control and perfection. And five, find healing in community. These lessons have helped me over the past year to cope positively with stress and disrupt my default stress coping behaviors, such as comfort eating and overworking. I have found sanctuary in my gardening. My experience isn't unique. Perhaps for many of us, gardening has been a welcoming self, a friend that embraces us as we are and invites us to stay a while, a respite from the outside world. In fact, People who spend time in nature on a regular basis report lower levels of anxiety and higher levels of well-being than those who don't. However, healing efforts at the individual level are incomplete without larger efforts to heal broken systems. For many, these times have widened equity gaps, complicating the plight for basic needs and survival. We must work together to make healing accessible for all, especially those who need it most. Food is not only sustenance, it is a matter of justice, of joy, of healing, and of pleasure. As a public health researcher, I am advocating for the creation of comprehensive gardening programs in marginalized communities to help address health disparities through holistic approaches. Yes, gardening can address many aspects of well being, the most obvious being nutrition and physical activity. However, there is also a spiritual element. It is a practical tool for stress management and for cultivating community. My final call of action today is to you, to identify a healing practice that works in your life. These practices are what helped my own healing journey, but I challenge you to experiment and find what works for you. Perhaps it's walking in nature, engaging in play, spending time with loved ones, taking time to rest, reflect, journal. In the end, the lessons that I have shared transcend gardening. They have the power to help you overcome challenges and experience growth in the process. Whatever you are facing in your life, you can make the choice to respond with resilience. Cheers to your journey and finding the practices that heal, nourish, and strengthen you.